Okay, hi there, it's Jeff back again with another in our series of key diagram videos for your micro and macro papers. Slightly different video this time. We're going to work through two examples of game theory. In a sense, they're kind of diagrams. They are the payoff matrices that uh, you often need to use in an exam question. So game theory, as such, is a technique. It's basically a technique used by economists to help understand and analyse how different people or groups or businesses will behave in a given situation, assuming that they're rational. Of course, they may not be rational. Game theory techniques really started uh, the development uh, in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, often linked to Cold War politics. One thinks about the work of uh, people such as von Neumann, Morgenstein, Nash, John Nash and others. A game theory payoff matrix, essentially like a diagram, and you need to know these for the exams, is a way of applying the concept of interdependent decision making. For example, between businesses in an oligopoly or a duopoly. So you won't be using this if you get a question on perfect competition or monopolistic competition, but yes, particularly if you get a question on oligopoly. For example, you can use a payoff matrix to help analyse and evaluate the benefits and the risks of price collusion between firms and also spending on non-price competition such as their expensive advertising campaigns. Now, the idea behind this video, if you stay with me, is to just to work through two examples two examples of payoff matrices that you could use really well in an exam question. Interdependence, keyword, please do use it, by the way, if you get any kind of question on oligopoly and behaviour of firms. It means that the behaviour of one firm, or one business, depends on the choices and the behaviour of other firms. Individual firms don't make decisions independently. Good example, if you think about the supermarkets, Tesco cuts the prices on barbecued food and sauces. Maybe as we reach the end of the summer holidays or into August and things in September, the other supermarkets might decide to do the same, or they might not, but they're going to base their strategy in part on Tesco's behavior, and therefore they might follow uh, by cutting prices as well. So, that kind of pricing, inter interdependent pricing, is very common in things like supermarkets, who knows, streaming services, mobile phone tariffs, petrol retailing, and so on and so forth. Okay, to the meat of this video two examples of a payoff matrix that you can use in your exams. Let's consider a duopoly, two firms, firm A, firm B, and they have a decision to make whether to, to raise the price in the market, charge a high price, or to lower the price, for example, a price war. The payoff matrix, firm A is always on the left-hand side, firm B is always on the right-hand side, and uh, the payoff is measured in terms of expected profit. Quite important in the exam to put that top left bit in. I'm just going to highlight that for you actually now just to remember this. It's quite important to put that in uh, because uh, that tells the examiner that, the, that what, the, what the implication is. This is expected profits in millions of pounds. So what should firm A do? Well, if firm A charges a low price, it will either get 12 million if firm B decides to raise their price or 7. Well, 12 is better than 10 and seven is better than three. Don't forget, firm A is on the left-hand side. So low price for firm A is, in fact, a dominant strategy. And because this is a symmetrical game, the same is true for firm B. If they charge a low price, they either get 12 or 10, or they get seven or three, depending on what firm A does. So again, their dominant strategy is to charge a low price, in which case, you'd probably end up with an equilibrium down in the bottom right there, where both firms charge a low price, and they both make profits of 7 million. However, that's not an optimum in terms of the combined situation. So if they were both to choose a high price, start again, if they're both to choose a high price, uh, and that, of course, we would call price collusion, price fixing, in theory, that would allow both of them to make 10 million each, and they maximise the joint profits. Can you see there, the joint profit would be 20, add the two together, instead of 14. So price collusion might be in the joint interests of both firms. However, price collusion can be fragile because if firm A expects firm B to charge to raise their price, they would have an incentive to lower their prices, create that gap in price. And of course, if they cheated on the collusion, they could make 12 and uh, that would bring down the profit for B from 10 to 3. Maybe not enough profit to stay in the market, who knows? But there's the, you know, firm A would have an incentive to just, just undercut, to go low, firm B is going high. 
And that's true for firm A, it's also true for firm B. So it might be that uh, you might return to a low price equilibrium. So there we go, that's a classic bit of, bit of Prisoner's Dilemma style game theory where it's in the individual best interest of firms to price low, they'd be better off by pricing high, in which case there's an incentive essentially to break the agreement. So for your exam, I strongly recommend, I could go even stronger than this, but please make sure you have one worked example in your revision notes of a pricing game payoff matrix. Maybe the one we've just been through. And also perhaps one, well, yeah, definitely one that focuses more on non-price competition. So let me offer you that one as well. Here's the situation. We've got two banks, Bank A, Bank B, and they're competing maybe for the maybe for accounts of students who've just finished their A-levels in IB and they're looking to open a new account ahead of going to university. You'll find this, by the way, that universities will be falling over themselves trying to get you to open an account, um, particularly because they know that you're likely to be very loyal to a bank once you've done that. Behavioral default behavior is quite strong. So in this behavior, so in this situation, the banks must decide whether to offer a free gift to customers, freebies, uh, who open a new, new account. But of course, these, these freebies come at a cost to the banks. So it basically adds to their marketing costs and reduces profits. So bank A on the left, bank B on the right, what should bank A do? Well, probably offer a freebie. If they offer a freebie, they'll either get five, and if the other bank offers no freebies, they'll get uh, 12. Or if they offer a freebie and the other bank offers, uh, that's right, so they'll either get, so, yep, five beats two and 12 beats 10. So if they offer a freebie and the other one doesn't, they'll get 12 and two. But if they offer a freebie and uh, the other bank um, offers no freebie, so it offers a freebie as well, they get five each. So in theory, in theory, they should both offer a freebie. And this is what, ten, what tends to happen. Banks get locked into offering these big, generous uh, introductory deals, perhaps, to new, to new customers. But these deals come at a cost. And it might be better off for both banks to not offer a freebie. Profits would be higher if both banks agreed not to provide freebies to new customers. OK, so they could agree not to do this. Let's, let's get rid of the freebies. Fine. But of course, then a bank has an incentive, whoops, an incentive to, uh, to renege on that agreement, to start offering freebies. Because if they did, so for example, if Bank A offered a freebie, but Bank B doesn't, Bank A could make 12 and Bank B would go down from 5 uh, uh, to 2. So here's a situation where uh, it may well be the case that they're locked into a Nash equilibrium where they're both offering freebies to get new customers. When if they both agreed not to do it, they might be better off. Persistently high levels of advertising and marketing spending can often be explained with reference to game theory ideas. Indeed, they can. If one firm desires to go heavy on marketing spend, others may follow suit, partly because of fear of losing market share and profits. So the Nash equilibrium might be high advertising spending for all firms, which may have little impact actually on revenues and profits. If Coca-Cola and, and Pepsi both spend a million dollars in an advertising slot on TV, they, the effects may actually cancel each other out. They have no noticeable impact on revenues and profits. But all they've done is added to fixed cost. And a good example of this, just to finish with, is this situation. These are the biggest spenders on advertising in the UK in 2020. Obviously, this was the year of pandemic. So you've got the government, Public Health England and the government, spending enormous sums of money on advertising. Uh, but look at all the other businesses in there. L'Oreal, Amazon, Beckett, Ben Kaiser, uh, Tesco's, Mackie D's, Procter & Gamble, Sky, Unilever. These are all companies which are, first and foremost, part of the oligopolistic markets, where there is a, almost like an equilibrium to spend a very high level of money on marketing and advertising, because other firms are doing the same. In reality, of course, it's uh, when, we, when we think about these simple games, it's difficult for firms to know what the payoffs might be, and we can make the numbers up. It's very hard to make accurate business predictions, very hard to know how the other firms will react. And also, don't forget, this, this, this simplified model does assume that people behave rationally. Game theoretical approaches assume rationality. They do the best they can for themselves. But entrepreneurs might be risk takers, prepared to gamble. Or firms might be risk averse during a recession. The, you know, the decisions you take on pricing during a recession, particularly in the last few years we've been through, are very different perhaps to what you would normally do in terms of normal business economic activity. So challenging the assumption of rationality is a good evaluative strategy to use.
So there we go. We've been through two examples of game theory. The key thing, I think, from the example of you is to have a good price example and a good non-price example in your revision notes, which you can bring out when the occasion demands. So please stay healthy, stay happy, stay positive, stay focused, and hopefully see you again sometime soon.